Good afternoon. I'm Kirk Varnado, and I'm giving the Mellon Lectures this year on the general topic of abstract art since Jackson Pollock, and this is the second of six lectures. And as they say, uh, if you had another destination in mind, now would be an excellent time to deplane. <laughs> if not, uh, I want to, last week I thanked those who came out for braving such a miserable and grisly day. Today I have to thank you all for sacrificing such a beautiful one. I'm not sure which is the nobler thing to do, but I'm grateful in both cases. Um, just as a general consideration, we can look at something wonderful while I'm talking. This is the National Gallery's beautiful Pollock Lavender Mist on the left and a detail of the same painting on the right. I was asked by a friend of mine during the week why I'd settled on the term abstraction. Um, he preferred and thought, why didn't I use non-figurative or non-representational? Abstraction, after all, comes from the Latin uh, abstract. Uh, this is not a treadmill for, softening, for building up your abdomen. The abstract, in fact, means to pull away from, to draw from, draw out of, and therefore tends to suggest that abstraction is somehow a derivative or second order taking away from vision or from things seen, whereas non-representational, non-figurative uh, has another connotation. I purposely did this basically because I believe everybody knows what I'm talk talking about when I say abstraction, uh, and because I don't like the non and all the non terms, I'd rather have something productive and positive about the nature of abstraction. And in fact, that differentiation, the idea of abstraction as something distilled out of nature versus the idea of abstraction as something productive rather than reductive, has been a big bugbear in the history of abstraction. There was a huge debate amongst French abstract artists in the 30s trying to form a group, and they could only settle on a hyphenated group, abstraction creation, in the sense of dividing those who claimed that they were producing pure forms not derived from vision or nature from those who were distilling down from visual experience. There's also been proposed the term concrete art to also represent something that is not abstract or drawn away. I always thought it sounded a little too much like cement. So I am staying with abstraction. And in any event, I dislike the idea of abstraction creation as a dilemma because it seems to me to po pose a false dichotomy between what the eye does and what the mind does. As we said last time, we talked about E. H. Gombrich's art and illusion. There is no seeing without some schema in the mind, and certainly there are very few thoughts in the mind that do not in some sense depend on experience. So where to cut the circle between uh, creation inside the mind and seeing outside? I prefer not to cut the circle at all, but keep on rolling with it and insisting on the constant cycling between, for example, representation and abstraction, between drawing away from the world and giving back to it uh, in, in the history of abstraction, both neurologically in the way that we perceive it and work with it, and socially in terms of its history, a constant cycling between seeing and inventing, representing and abstracting, uh, especially as it pertains to the use of in art of already extant man-made forms such as we'll be examining today. Today's lecture, it's called Survivals and Fresh Starts, is largely about the 1950s. And um, I show you here a Donald Judd stack from the 1960s, from 1967. There's sort of two pieces of received wisdom to know about the 1950s. And that is that abstract expressionism like Pollock's uh, succeeded because of a CIA plot that in fact its triumph was engineered by a malevolent and manipulative forces who exported it as propaganda for the United States. And the second thing to know is that abstraction was killed off by things like the Judd stack on the right, by the young Turks of pop and minimal art around 1960, uh, who found in its exhaustion uh, and depletion, that of abstract expressionism, an occasion for a re kind of reaction innovation which produced the hard edge art like Judd's. So on the one hand, uh, conspiracy theory, the CIA plot, on the other hand, catastrophe theory, the collapse and, and remake in the form of minimalism, each of them oversimplifying history, it seems to me, and also falsifying some very basic issues. And I want to revisit each of these things in turn. Let's talk first of all about the argument about the CIA plot. 
And here is an installation view of an exhibition set abroad by the International Council of the Museum of Modern Art in 1958 called The New American Painting, a show which toured Europe principally in Rome, in Paris, uh, in London. And this exhibition, like other exhibitions mounted by the Museum of Modern Art, so the argument goes, are stalking horses for a kind of governmental or a, a certainly uh, institutional vision of America and American freedoms, and that the exhibitions were sent through the Museum of Modern Art as a kind of cover by interested parties, not only interested in governmental issues, but also in corporate issues like those of the Rockefellers, sent abroad to Europe as uh, tools in a kind of battle for the hearts and minds of the intelligentsia in Europe as a Cold War device that is a battle against the Soviet Union to insist on the greater freedoms, the greater possibilities, to insist that America had a culture uh, again, and to show the Europeans that Americans were not all just Coca-Cola and bubble gum, but that there was something to respect and to wage a battle for the leadership, the intellectual leadership of Europe to come on the side of the Americans. Um, you know, there is a grain of truth to this argument, perhaps more than a grain. The government and many government agencies, the CIA, the USIA, were extremely interested in a cultural battle during the Cold War. It's become clear from a lot of documents now that there were major magazines then thought to be liberal and independent, like Encounters, that in fact turned out to be uh, funded by the CIA. And there was an active effort on the part of various governmental agencies, in fact, to wage a culture war for those hearts and minds. It was certainly true on the other side as well. The uh, rights paranoid fantasy that the peace movement in Europe in the 50s was just funded by Moscow. In fact, turns out to be true in many respects that the peace movement did receive a lot of funding from Moscow, just as many uh, US cultural manifestations like encounters were in fact funded by the CIA. So there's a strong uh, grain of truth in the idea of propaganda. It just doesn't happen to work in the case of the New American Painting or the International Council of the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I remember my friend Adam Gopnik used to say that from outside, the Roman Empire looked like all aqueducts and legionnaires. From inside, it looked like cats in the sewers. Perhaps <laughs> it's because I worked at the Museum of Modern Art for almost 20 years that I have difficulty believing in it as an efficient tool of the representation <laughs> of any particular interest whatsoever. <clears throat> but I think that even an objective outsider looking hard at the argument has to find a strong six degrees of separation involvement in which the protagonists at the Museum of Modern Art are guilty by association because their brother's cousin worked for the Rockefellers or because during the war they were in the OSS, et cetera, et cetera. And the, article, the argument, it seems to me, uh, loses a lot of ground just on its particulars. It also is an argument that has a lot of ironies uh, in it, it seems to me. First of all, it would certainly be ironic, though not implausible, that we would be exporting as a tool against communism the very art that was being denounced as communistic uh, in the US Senate or House of Representatives <laughs> by people like Representative Don Darrow from Michigan. I think that uh, no one was more in agreement about abstract art than Stalin and Truman, for example. <laughs> Both of them <laughs> disliked it a lot. The other irony, of course, is that we didn't impose or export these shows. The people at the Museum of Modern Art were strongly beseeched by Europeans to send the shows. That's why they were mounted. And if you wanted a reading of this art as being act American, you had to read the French critics to get it. They were the ones who insisted on Pollock, for example, as a lariat swinging son of Wyoming, whereas at home, Greenberg and later uh, Bill Rubin were insisting on his links to Picasso and Brock uh, and the analytic cubism of 1911-12 so that Picasso is a cowboy in Paris and a cubist in New York. <laughs> but the big problem with the idea of this as a tool of the Cold War, a tool of anything else, is that in regard to abstract art like Pollux, you simply cannot control the consequences of the thing. For example, Clement Greenberg's argument would have been that the logical consequence 
of Pollock culturally in the line that started with Picasso and Brock and analytic cubism would be to move to a more ethereal still form of abstraction that is something more all over, less dependent even on line and traditional space like this gorgeous Morris Lewis called Tet of 1958. And that would be the logical progression of where one should go stimulated by Pollock. But in fact, a lot of European artists before they even saw Pollock had seen Hans Namath's photographs of Pollock at work and had a very different idea of what the ne next logical step might be. So that, for example, the French artist Yves Klein in 1960 staged this performance piece which clearly relates to Pollock's working on the floor and the idea of painting on the floor. The difference being that Klein paints his models with blue and has them drag themselves or be dragged across the canvas on the floor while an orchestra plays in the background in front of a suited audience. This was called Anthropometries uh, in March 9, 1960. Um, quite a, what might, one might say, um, vive la traduction. Uh, that is, this is a translation issue of high complexity here in terms of the French reading of Pollock. I think if one ever wanted, in fact, a little illustration for one's future essay on the Frenchness of French art, this would probably be the frontispiece, or one of them, in terms of the translation of what's on the left into what's on the right. But I'm not at all sure what it did to change Sartre's idea about Coca-Cola. Um, more seriously, though, in terms of not controlling consequences, David Carrier has shown long ago that abstract expressionism, if looked at in a broader parameter than just the US-Europe exchange to Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, that abstract expressionism let loose on the world became the uh, preferred style of dissent against many dictatorial governments that we supported. And thus, uh, if you bring the loaded gun of ABEX into your exhibition program, you are just as likely to shoot your own foot off with it if you are trying to use it as agitprop or propaganda. It doesn't work that well that way. But in fact, the left, it seems to me, has had a dual problem with abstract expressionism that is either as what might one, one might call a headlock or as what one might call a necktie, that is, on the one hand, brainwashing, extremely powerful, strong, subversive uh, carrier of promoted American values, and on the other hand, something that can be so easily trivialized and turned to fashion that Cecil Beaton could pose his model in front of Lavender Mist, exactly the same painting, in 1951. That is, the left is unsure whether Abex is an opiate or just a cocktail. Um, on the one hand, a sinister Trojan horse, for American values and on the other a pathetic running dog of American capitalist or com uh, corporate interests. In both cases, the argument is that abstraction, and abex in particular, is too manipulable, that it has unclear meaning, that it's too usable by the bad guys. But just to show another example of abstract expressionism, here is Pollock's number 32, 1950, from the Museum in Dusseldorf, and I show it to give some sense of its enormous scale. But if uh, there was a fake Americanism, a promoted, hyped, and peculiar Americanism about ABEX, which argued for the individual freedom of this gestural painting, about the whole idea of vast space in America, about great scope for individual gesture, if this was a fake Americanism, the left is, I think, convinced that on the other side of the divide, in work like Judd's on the right, and this is another Judd sequence piece from the 60s, there is a true Americanism embedded in minimalism, which is not at all about freedom, but about corporate power. Uh, and there's a lot of reading of minimalism in terms of its repetitious structures, in terms of its hard-edged geometry, in terms of its dependence on large scale, in terms of its regularity, its cold efficiency, etc., as being a purely technocratic or corporate kind of art, which is covertly about that side of American life, which is all about power and production. Now, just on a local level, it seems to me, one could e easily argue the inverse of this fake versus real a juxtaposition. For one thing, it's just a contingent fact 
that a painting like the Pollock on the left could not have been made and shown or had any life in Moscow in 1950. Now that you know, doesn't excuse uh, lynchings in the South or bad wages in Detroit or poverty in Appalachia any more than the peace movement in Poland excuses the gulag, but in fact it happens to be true just as a contingent fact. And on the other side of life, as far as minimalism and its coded representation of power, it seems to me that minimalism is just plain odder than that. But Judd, in fact, had his metal works fabricated at a kind of mom and pop metal shop, Greenberg and family in New Jersey, and that the results are often a kind of fussy, slicko, decorative work, which has to do with Harley Davidson paint colors, a colored plexiglass, etc. But there's something quite small time and peculiar about a lot of minimalism, and that one needs to look again at its model of work and fabrication as perhaps having the same kind of nostalgia for small product America, uh, for small uh, metalwork frame, for example, shops, or uh, chopper shops, or body shops, for example, that might dovetail with the kind of nostalgia you see in Lichtenstein's embrace of romance comics or Warhol's love for the faded glamour of Marilyn Monroe. That is, Greenberg and Brothers bears the same relationship to Raytheon, for example, that, say, uh, true romance comics bears to mass media. And there's a whole different thing to be said about minimalism's idea of fabrication and work going down that path. But be that as it may, the whole question of the left's reading of the fake and the true Americanism in these two sides begs the much larger question, and that is, can abstract forms, can abstract art, have fixed meanings? I said that abstract art makes for bad agitprop, and that's because the only way to control its meanings is to control the people who view it. For as many viewers who will have the right to make up their mind about the Pollock on the left, there are going to be that many different feelings for whether it is more about savage energy or lyricism, whether it dances or explodes, etc., etc. And when the left asks of abstract art, like Pollock's, to be more resistant to other uses, to bad uses, when it causes, calls for greater rebellion and greater intransigence on the part of the art, it seems to me that what is actually being called for is a greater, more monolithic societal solidarity, which would limit the meanings that could be produced by the art. The fact is that as we've seen last time and again this time with Pollock, the same form in abstract art can give rise to very different meanings. That's the reception end of it. But today I want to concentrate a little more on the inception end of it. That is the principal topic that different meanings and intentions, on the other hand, also give rise to or attach themselves to very similar forms. Same forms give rise to different meanings. Different meanings and intention give rise to very similar forms again requiring us to look extremely closely at the particular things before us. Because in art, as a kind of motto of what I've been saying, by making simpler things, we don't make things any simpler. That is, reduction does not yield certainty, but something like its opposite, which is ambiguity and multivalence. So rather than being the kind of lecturer who takes an extremely complicated and thorny situation and tries it make, to make it simpler, I'm here to sow confusion um, <laughs> and complexity. And my test case for today is going to be the hard edge geometric art of the 1960s. And I'll take as my starting point an exhibition held 10 years after the new American painting that we looked at a moment ago. And that's the show sent abroad, again by the Museum of Modern Art in 1968, called The Art of the Real. There is ostensibly a shared aesthetic in all the objects that you see in these two views and the show as a whole. And the thesis was that after the kind of weakened mush of second generation 10th Street Gallery abstract expressionism in the late 50s, 
There emerged in the early 60s an art being celebrated now in 68 in this exhibition, which was of a greater certainty, a greater decisiveness, a greater clarity, a greater sharpness, which had no hidden cards about angst or metaphysics or psychology, but was a new kind of brash, hard-nosed, and act-American empirical art, all about the immediacy of immediate sensory apprehension with nothing else behind it, that which was real, that which was hard and one could kick against. Now, let's take as a test case uh, just one of the works in the show, and that is the one that you see in the uh, slide on the left, and that's the Pyramid by Carl Andre, uh, a piece that had been rebuilt in wood for the show, but which was originally conceived in 1959. And here is a photograph of that Ur vision version of it, now lost. Now, the piece appears Lincoln Log simple uh, and gruff in a way that might fit with Andre's reputation as having worked as a brakeman on the Penn Central Railroad in the early 60s. But this is a brakeman who went to Andover with Stella. And in fact, the piece is involved in a broad and complicated reinvention of modern art. Andre breaks, oops, sorry. Andre breaks with the tradition of Picasso's constructed sculpture, which had so dominated art up to and including David Smith, finding in works like the one on the left and all of its descendants a residual anthropomorphism, a kind of head and torso structure, also a, a residual pictorialism, that it was like painting, it hung on a wall, it presented itself more like painting. And instead of looking back to that tradition, Andre reaches around to another point in early modern art, and that's the art of Constantin Brancusi. What he likes about Brancusi is it seems to eliminate the idea of the head and foot because it's equal. It could be upside down and it would be exactly the same way. This is Brancusi's endless column, one of many versions of the same in the Museum of Modern Art. And he liked as well that rather than being pictorial or having any idea of a frame, it just sat on the floor with no base, no symbolic separation from us, but an immediate involvement in the present tense. And the pyramid with its upside, upside down, right side up symmetry, with its all four sides the same sculpturalness, with its sitting flat on the floor, clearly is very much a part of a Brancusi revival used against the grain of the constructed cubist tradition. And it's part, if I might put a just little parenthesis in the middle of the talk here, it's part of a broader remaking of the modern tradition between 1955 and 1960. I said last time that I didn't love the idea of the late 50s as the moment of the birth of postmodernism. And in that context, I talked last time, apropos the John's flag, about a revival of Duchamp. If there were time, you could also show that that same revival of Duchamp is occurring in Britain, in the independent group, where it's accompanied by a revival of Italian futurism as well, that all flows directly into pop art in the 1960s. So you get non-school of Paris traditions, non-mainstream Picasso Matisse traditions being pulled up and used against the grain of school of Paris in the mid-50s. In the case of proto-pop, say, it's Duchamp and futurism, but in Andre's case, it's Brancusi, but also something tougher. That is, the residual romance of carving that was so important to Brancusi in hewing out the endless column, for example, is replaced in Andre by something tougher, which has to do with the modular assemblage of ready-made pieces with a kind of analytic breakdown of the structure of the piece, which no longer even has the standard volumetric solids that Brancusi has. And that goes back to the idea of using elemental materials like logs, for example, or two-by-fours. And that tradition that Andre seems to be referring to is more the tradition of Russian constructivism. And here is a Rodchenko called Spatial Construction of, of 1920, which is the kind of work that Andre might have been looking at because Russian constructivism, like futurism, like Duchamp, was being revived and thought about in a new way in the late 1950s. 1958 saw a major Malievich show in Amsterdam, for example, and crucially in 1962, the British art historian Camilla Gray produced The Great Experiment, which was the first widely available documentation of the early years of 
constructivist experiment in Russia, which had been so effectively suppressed by the Soviets since the 1930s. What Andre and other artists looked to through Camilla Gray was the original tradition of Russian constructivism, which tended to be a bifurcated tradition. And here I show you two Rodchenkos that suggest the bifurcation. They're both from the early 20s. Uh, one of them is an advertisement on the left. The other one is a painting called Red, Yellow, Blue, which is simply that, three paintings assembled, each one entirely red, one entirely yellow, one entirely blue. That is, this speaks to the way that Russian constructivism, on the one hand, wanted to reanalyze the primary elements of all experience, to go back to two-by-four art, to modular art, like the wooden piece that we just looked at, to take painting down to its basics, to strip away everything and get to the fundamental, elemental basics of art, at the same time to reach out and make art useful and a tool of mass persuasion. So that constructivism is an art which sought on the one hand to re-examine the basics and springing from that re-examination of the basics to remake everything from towers to teacups and to remake especially the means of communication. The question of art and where art fit in the spectrum was of less interest to them. Visual experience and its usefulness in a constructive, productive society was the ideology. And this grand ideology of remaking from stem to stern and top to bottom all the way through was then disseminated out of Russia. And after its suppression within Russia, increasingly within the 30s, when the government called for more understandable things like socialist realism to be communicated to its people, this bifurcated tradition of elemental analysis and public outreach worked out through the Bauhaus into a broad European tradition on the one hand, in advertising, and here are some Herbert Bayer posters and advertisements on the left, and on the other hand, into pedagogy, as in Joseph Albers on the right, and this is one of the uh, long series of works called Homage to the Square by Albers from the 1950s, this one from 1953. So the original firebrand Russian constructivism tended to become by the 30s and 40s, through the Bauhaus and many Bauhaus clones, institutionalized, banalized, and commercialized into, on the one hand, basic design courses, like the kind that Albers taught, like the kind that were taught at the Chicago Bauhaus, and on the other hand, into good design and good graphics for corporate purposes or for advertising, like that on the left. So that by the time you get to the 1960s, when you suddenly get a work like Frank Stella, and here is Grand Cairo uh, of the early 60s on the left, when you get to a work like, uh, this is 1962, like Stella's, and you look at it in comparison to the Albers, first of all, what one should say, of course, is the Albers is much smaller. It's like this big, whereas the Stella's got to be about five or six foot square, a giant picture, really powerful. That the Stella has everything you think about in terms of the 60s. It's jazzy, it's bold, it's pop-like in its colors, it's aggressive. And the Albers seems merely didactic. Um, it seems to be the residue of an old system. It seems to be something that's far more staid. And so one is inclined to think that despite the fact that there are concentric squares at work, that what you're looking at here is just a big coincidence, that there's just uh, nothing to this. But I wonder if that's true. Uh, it's easy, and art historians often do, to sneer at students who would propose this kind of relationship and say, oh, you've just got it all wrong, you don't get it, you don't understand it. But let's go back and look a little more closely at another descent of Albers, for example. And here are two Albers lithographs of 1942. The one on the left uh, having to do with Monte Alban, that is, it's a play on the geometry of Mexican pyramids, for example, and the one on the right called Ascension. Um, these are lithographs which exploit basic design elements. They're about repetition. They're about the conundrums of recession and, uh, and projection, uh, spatial organization, about the use of thick and thin, about the qualities of line. They're the kind of thing that thousands of students 
in good design and good advertising at the Chicago Bauhaus or at Black Mountain College under Albers or at Yale must have been asked to do and look at to train themselves in the dilute form of constructivism's expl exploits. Um, but you can get an ascent back out of this in certain artists trained in the design tradition, trained in the commercial tradition of dilute or diaspora constructivism, as you might call it, that then try to bring it back up into the realm of art in painting. And here, for example, is a Francois Morillet painting, a French artist who was himself an industrial engineer or designer who mostly made his career in that, in industry and commerce, but who became interested in moving his sense of design or abstraction out of that utilitarian world into the world of painting and art in pictures like the one on the right called Painting of 1952 or here is another picture entitled Painting of 1953. And now maybe you realize where I'm headed um, and that's back to Frank Stella in 1959, six years later, and the marriage of reason and squalor. Uh, picture that we looked at last time that's in the Museum of Modern Art. The first thing to say is that there's a huge difference between these things physically and then that's extremely important. The morale is perhaps 20 inches on the long side whereas the uh, Stella is about six feet on the short side. So you get an idea of a small demonstration piece in the morale and a big physical object with a stretcher as thick as your fist uh, on the Stella on the right. There are also other differences which are conceptual and important. And that is beyond the physical idea that Stella is elevating the process of systematic repetition of stripes, the uh, determination of a focused plan of parallel lines, beyond the fact that Stella elevates it to something simply larger and bigger, there's a big conceptual divide in that the idea of the systematic for morale is based on the diluted concept constructivist idea of impersonality and objectivity as a means of approaching a kind of scientism kind of socially productive anonymity on the part of the artist which will breed social solidarity by generating universally uh, apprehensible forms and conforming to an anti-bohemian sense of unromantic, strong, systematic organization that will be like modern technology and modern science. So you have two very, very different reasons for doing what's being done here. That on the one hand, the impersonality in the Stella tends to be reactive uh, against the sloppiness of uh, second generation abstract expressionism, for example, and tends to be filtered through the scale and immediate physicality of Pollock. Whereas the morale is an echo ping of the constructivist tradition trying to be amplified back up into something and has to do his anonymity with the kind of not reactive but regenerative scientism which has to do with the post-war world in France and the need for a constructive sense of anti-romantic building art that would regenerate European culture after the debacle of World War II. So they're coming Stella through the route of Johns's stripes as we talked about last time and Pollock's house paint and scale arriving here collides on some formal level with a totally different vector on the part of Morale out of commercial design, out of engineering, trying to come up to the level of a constructive or scientific art. I might say that in ter terms of the bohemian, of course, I think one of the things that distinguishes these two is the kind of impersonal, uh, mechanical timelessness, if you want, of the morale, whereas we feel about Stella that there is a very definite 1959 last breath of the beat generation, black espresso grinds sense of darkness about the picture um, that's confirmed by a lot of Stella's titles, which are about bars and dives in New York. Am I sowing enough confusion here? Am I trying? Around 1960, it seems to me that we're in a world of confusion. 
that you could take, for example, the art of the real show that I talked about in 1968 and put it next to Max Bill's 50 years of concrete art in Switzerland and try to count the overlaps between Bill's claim that what he's showing is the reflowering of a long constructivist tradition and the American claim in 1968 that what they're showing is the birth of a new Americanism in hard edge art and see how many artists try to get appropriated by both exhibitions that what you're dealing with in the 60s is a collision between reborn survivals and fresh takes. And those fresh takes often involving, as Brancusi to Andre or Andre to Rodchenko, often involving leaps back over what is considered the decadent or diluted or normalized version of the constructivist tradition back to its roots in Russia in 1920 or 1917. So in the early 60s, you get Donald Judd writing on Malyevich, Andre going back to Rodchenko, Flavin naming neon pieces for Totlin, etc., etc. And you get, therefore, as between, say, Max Bill and Gene Goosen, the organizer of The Art of the Real, arguments and overlaps in regards to the claims for meaning of very closely similar forms. Now, in at least one case, it's seemingly easy to see the old new confusion because it all happens in one person, and that's the sculptor Tony Smith. The Smith's large-scale geometric sculpture of the 1960s was embraced by the minimalists, and yet uh, Tony Smith was a close friend of Pollock's. He was very close to Pollock in the heyday of abstract expressionism in the early 50s, and his root, the roots of his aesthetic lie in that group. But still more interesting, Smith's early career was as an architect. Even before his involvement with the abstract expressionist painters, he had trained in architecture, and he had trained in architecture of a very particular kind. And here are two uh, Tony Smith drawings of the 1950s, a plan for a linear city on the left of 1953-55, and a plan for a Catholic church on the right in which the idea of a lattice structure is related to nested hexagons in a way that has to do, on the one hand, with Smith's interest in organic form, in the way that honeycombs are built, in the way that bees work. One of his hexagonal sculpture, sculptures has the delightful title, Bees Do It, uh, for example. Um, and this organicism extended not just to the organization of a church, as in the plan on the right, but as an organization of whole communities on the left so that we might live like the bees live. Um, and this has to do with his relationship not only to a residual Bauhaus training, but specifically to Frank Lloyd Wright and the idea of a geometric organicism an ideal geometry drawn from the complexity of nature that would be the basis for a reformation of our habitat and lived environment. This is the aesthetic, this sense of geometry, that Smith plucks away from the architectural contest, context excuse me, in a drawing like the one on the right of 1967, which happens to be a drawing for the sculpture we just looked at a moment ago called Smoke, shown in the large exhibition of 1967 at the Corcoran called Scale as Content, where Smith looked completely at home by and was completely understood as being related to younger geometers like Ronald Bladen with this large big X. We're back then at a variant of Albers and Stella, Morley and Stella. That is, you're dealing here with something which seems to be similar in form, but involves a misunderstanding of intent. That once one looks at the origins, one sees that Smith is, what you say, coming from a different place. And therefore, Smith is often talked about as an anomaly, as just a simple misunderstanding within minimalism. But I wonder whether that's true, whether when you begin to look at the pattern of relationships of lookalikes that we're building here, that Smith doesn't seem to be part of a broader picture of recouping and reinventing the past on the one hand in the 60s and of translation from architecture and architectural concerns into painting and sculpture and art. Now, a more interesting and complex case than Smith's, which is rather continuous and easy to trace, is the case of Ellsworth Kelly because Kelly is the last 
American artist of his generation, certainly the last American artist perhaps of stature, to have crucially depended on training in Paris as the foundation of his work. It used to be necessary for any American artist to go to Paris, but Ellsworth picked the moment to go to Paris, which seems to have been just the wrong piece of timing, that he was gone during the boom years of abstract expressionism in the late 40s and early 1950s, and returned only to the United States around 1953, uh, and then producing what appeared to be retardataire or backward art became embraced come the 60s as a precursor. And so that, for example, in Gene Goosen's Art of the Real exhibition, where we saw the Andre Pyramid before, Kelly was featured on the opening wall just past the title as a precursor to the new hard edge American art along with Georgia O'Keeffe. So here, for example, is, can I ask some of my friends at Caswell if they could refill my water because I'm going to go bone dry here, thanks. Um, Kelly's black and white relief on the right, which he had made in 1949, was hung next to and is roughly the same size as, we're dealing about this big, it's not a very big object, it's um, rather in fact fragile, it's like a kite in a way, it's a real structure of lattice of wood with a canvas behind it, and it was placed next to O'Keeffe's Lake George window for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that Goosen wanted to root the new hard edge work of the 60s in something act American as O'Keeffe was. The Lake George window seem have to do all to do with a kind of shaker-like vernacular in American art and O'Keeffe's kind of precisionist 1929 precise detailing and hard edgeness seemed to be of a piece with Kelly's insistence on this. But there was another reason as well in the sense they were both now seen to be windows. That is, Kelly had taken the decision at this point in his career to rename the black and white relief of 1949 as Museum of Modern Art Window Paris. Uh, and he in fact had taken the occasion to reveal to Goosen its source, which in fact is a window in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, and here is that window here. And Goosen made a good deal of this connection in the sense that he wanted to insist that the new art of the real did not have about it any smarmy idealism, any metaphysics, but had to do with seeing, for example, with empiricism, with sensory apprehension, and therefore rooting the art in seeing, in the actual experience of the world, was taken as a way of differentiating now I'm flooded, thank you very much. <laughs> this will, now I'll have to take a bathroom break at some point, sorry. Um, so that Kelly and Goosen together repositioned Kelly's art in the world of empiricism, in the world of seeing. That is, there's a kind of anti-idealism in repositioning this geometry into an American context of seeing. What's interesting is that in the 1990s, the example of the connection between Kelly's work on the right and its source on the left is revised yet again, and that it's insisted on that this is more like Duchamp's taking the toilet and putting it in an art exhibition. That is, Kelly's thing involves not the Museum of Modern Art window, involves not the mere impression of nature, but a radical act of mind and strategy akin to Duchamp's subversion of all of the ideas of authorship, which blow out any sense of comp composing or inventing anything and get rid of everything that was so-called arty, instead using finding and appropriating rather than inventing as a way of making art. So whereas Goosen and Kelly in the 60s push against the ideal in the direction of seeing, in the 90s the push is against the ideal in the direction of thinking in the idea of strategy and subversion in a Duchampian sense. So that Kelly is on the one hand more like Judd in the 60s, on the other hand more like Johns uh, in the 90s, uh, the same two things are pushed back and forth. But at the risk of piling still more on this delicate structure on the right, is there not something missing here in this equation? And that is some kind of 
middle road, which might take us back to the relief in black and white. After all, that's not just any window in Paris. It doesn't look like a lot of windows in Paris. This building was built in the 1930s. Um, everybody who's been to the Palais de Tokyo or the Musée de l'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, which is now in this building, knows that this building is a little fascisty, one might say, but also very modern and has strong echoes of modern design. Um, in fact, it's right at home with things like a Mondrian painting, for example, called Composition in White and Black of 1930. That just as Mondrian drew inspiration from architecture, architects drew inspiration from Mondrian, and what one's dealing with in the unusual elongated proportions and the parsing out of the tripart division, tripart division at the bottom of the window is the architecture of the new building of the 1930s echoing the idea of modern design and modern design elements. So we're once again back in the circle from high abstract art into the broad world of modern design, back up in Kelly's case into the world of abstract art in the relief in black and white that later then becomes the Museum of Modern Art window. You could look at another Kelly called Neuilly of 1950, identified solely by its locale, the suburb of Paris, but then re-identified by Kelly later on as a tracing of paving stones in a driveway, a direct tracing of paving stones. Of course, it has an uncanny similarity to the vocabulary, again, of Mondrian and idealist geometry and de style geometry, in, not only in Mondrian, but in Duisburg, uh, Van Tangelo, and many no other Dutch artists of the 1920s and 30s. Now, Mondrian was then a very unknown factor in Paris when Kelly was painting, but the direct connection is precisely not the point that I'm trying to make. That is that the built environment of the 30s and 40s, like the building from which the window was taken, was suffused with the dilute principles involved in this painting. And secondly, that Kel Kelly himself is carrying around these principles in an unconscious way in his own eye. Uh, so that you don't need Mondrian, for example, if you've got something like an Albers here of 1940, uh, pardon me, of 1929, which again is a proto-Bauhaus interest in reversal of black and white and proportions, et cetera, and there are many other Albers one could have chosen. The point is not pointing out a source here, but a world of form, which takes us back to the fact that Kelly's earliest training before he went into the army in the war, was at Pratt Institute, and that he first thought he was going to be a commercial artist, and that he trained at Pratt precisely when Pratt's curriculum had been redesigned in imitation of the Chicago Bauhaus, and the design curriculum led directly into things like Albers's exercises. And he had then gone on in the war to be in the camouflage battalion precisely because of his design skills. It was only later after the war that Kelly moved to Boston to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and then to Paris and decided to become a high artist, not a commercial designer. In some sense, what we are seeing in the Museum of Modern Art window is thus, to what degree of consciousness one could argue, a marriage of the two sides of Kelly's early life in which you involved in a promotion of minor to major. I think of, for example, my friend Adam Gopnik's argument about how the Demoiselle d'Avignon represented for Picasso the elevation of the caricatures and the deforming aggressive caricatural style of his sketchbooks onto the canvas, a way of translating an innate uh, already acquired language into a different context by elevation that then changes radically the framework into which it's put. That in some sense, what I'm saying is that in the Museum of Modern Art window for Kelly, both the thing that is seen and the way that the artist sees it are both extremely impure and already corrupted with art. That they are neither pure acts of seeing, a la Goosen and the art of the real, nor are they pure acts of thinking and appropriation, a la the Duchamp interpretation, but that they are already corrupted with the ideal of Mondrian and design work in its dilute and broad spread fashion in terms of basic design and in terms of architecture. Let me try another example, which might drill this home a little further. Here's a wonderful Kelly, 
slightly later, called La Combe I of 1950, like Neuilly, a picture only identified by the place in which it was done, La Combe in France. La Combe of 1950, which is divided in panels with this beautiful rhythmic structure, um, Kelly revealed much later on that the painting is based on a photograph of shadows falling on a set of stairs at Lacombe, where he was on vacation prior to painting the picture. And you can see that it's not a direct translation. There are, in fact, many versions of Lacombe which reuse the staccato beat, the breaking, the diagonal in different ways. But one wonders, when, one, when Kelly looked down those stairs, what his training at Pratt years before had to do with his unconscious ability to apprehend the counter changes between light and dark, to see the pattern in something, to see the flatness in what was otherwise spatial, and one thinks, and again, this is not an argument for a source, but just a generic thing. Here is the Albers design exercise called Steps of 1931 in terms of interference between shadow and light, spatial qualities and depth, uh, flatness, et cetera, et cetera. And one could find a dozen zillion things more like it, and it's the same vocabulary that goes into good advertising design, for example, like this Richard Paul Loza poster of 1962, which uses the idea of taking a familiar object and making it unfamiliar by breaking it up with layers of overlay as a good constructivist principle that's been around since the 20s and 30s. But I don't pick the Loza poster just randomly, but because I'm interested in Richard Paul Loza as a much forgotten figure in the United States, very close to Max Bill, a concrete artist in Zurich who, like Morale, made his living in um, made his living in commercial design and graphic work, like the poster we just saw, but who aspired to be an artist. And here is Kelly's painting in the Museum of Modern Art, Colors for a Large Wall of 1951, and I put it next to a 1950 conception by Loza called Painting 17. Notice that I said a 1950 conception, because where we talked about the difference between the 20-inch Morale and the 10-foot Stella, it's important to insist here that originally this was only a small drawing like this in 1950-51, and that only in 1976, long later, did Loza realize the ambition to make it into a large painting. And so Kelly's very large picture already of 1951 clearly has a different relationship to this uh, than it does to that historically. But let's put the two of them together, even in terms of bringing the conceptions up to collide with each, with each other, and think again what the relationship between these two might be. Because Loza belongs to that world of design and construction like Morale, which is involved with an ideology of design. The ideology of anonymity, the ideology of productivity, the ideology of doing something constructive, not bohemian, involve very much with a socialist sense of productive, constructive society after the war. And reaching back to the constructivist tradition, what Loza believes he's involved with in paintings like this or in projects for paintings like drawings like this is the systematic examination of the bases of color, getting down to the laws and order by which art can become scientific. Kelly, on the other hand, is coming from a completely different place. Kelly's arrangement of these colors is in, in fact based on chance, not on systemic organization of palette or organization of colors by spectrum, but in fact collages of small bits of paper based on the idea of casting dice in a certain sense, drawing numbers, arranging chance organizations as much based on his contact, Kelly's, with ARP in Paris and a residual Dada tradition as is in contact with John Cage, the American and Cage's interest in chance. That is, Kelly's way to get outside of himself and away from subjectivity is not through system but through serendipity. And one might look also at the Loza paintings and see how different an art of systematic scientism and basic analysis differs from one which, like Kelly's, is sensitive to environment. 
because this picture is painted shortly after Kelly returns from the south of France. Several things are true about that visit to the south of France that one gets not only the sense of Matisse in some of these colors, and the late Matisse was very much a factor in the early 50s, but also the white is very much the white of the Mediterranean. And the more that you look at the picture, it is not only the syncopation of chance, the jazziness, but also the brightness of the white that begins to make the Loza look more static, more stable, uh, more inert in comparison to the unpredictable, never boring, constantly interesting Kelly with its upbeat impersonality as opposed to its deadened scientific impersonality in Loza. It's also worth noting that in that trip to the south of France, he not only looked, Kelly did, at the colors of the Mediterranean and at the architecture of the Mediterranean and thought about Matisse, but he also went to Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation in Marseille and saw the idea of Corbu painting large colors on the walls of this new form of architecture uh, in the 1950s. And if we think about what's outside of us now in the lobby of the National Gallery, this work by 19, uh, 1978, which has been recently relocated, and I mean recently, in the last couple of days, to the wall of the National Gallery's atrium, we can see a distant cousin to Kelly's early 50s desire to reunite constructivist abstraction with architecture. That is in a very different way from the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art Paris window, which abstracts out of the design of architecture into art, now to take the analysis of art in color and the spirit of his serendipitous arrangement of colors and project it back onto the wall because this is called Colors for a Large Wall and has to do with Kelly's ambitions in that period. Um, oops, sorry. Has to do with Kelly's ambitions in that period to paint something very, very big. We're missing one picture here. Well, just to remind you, let's go back. Kelly's color for a large wall in the context of the 1950s would not only have been drawn from Corbusier, but it would have been involved with a whole effort to remake that tradition of colored architecture, I'm sorry, this is a black and white slide, of the artist Alejandro Otero in a polychrome wall for the School of Architecture in the University of Venezuela uh, in Caracas. Something being built by Carlos Villanueva exactly in 1952-60. Uh, and here is Kelly in front of a picture called Cité, precisely of 1951, which he imagined in a sketch as a giant mural picture. It is a picture like colors for a large wall made out of fragments done by chance. If you can see the structure of it, it's a grid of a line drawing which was cut into pieces and then reassembled by chance so that it has an odd combination of grid-like rigidity and system on the one hand, and on the other hand, a kind of serendipity. And this would distinguish it from near lookalikes like Jesus Soto, for example, the Venezuelan artist, interfering parallels of 1952. What you get in the early 50s is, again, the resurgence in artists like Morele, in artists like Otero, in artists like Soto, and especially in Latin America, where the constructivist tradition has been exported through artists like Bill, the resurgence out of the world of good design to the ambition of a new high art of socialist solidarity. So that, for example, in the University of Venezuela, you get abstraction rendered as an official style in numerous murals like this, for example, in a country that's run by a dictator uh, who's overthrown a civilly elected government. And as the form of progression here in progressive work involves the updating or upsurging of the disseminated diasporic constructivist tradition now back up into a hard edge abstraction of the early 50s that's associated with state solidarity either under a socialist ambition as in Loza's or Bill's or under a more solidly governed state as in Venezuela.
So that what Kelly is dealing with when he associates with artists like Soto, who's his close friend in Paris, is something which is remarkably close to what he's doing. And in fact, Kelly applies to teach at Ohm, at the school run by Max Bill, in which Loza is also involved in Zurich. He's on the fringes of this kind of official resurgence of hard edge constructivism, but differentiating himself by his interest in chance, by his refusal to have an art of the necessary. And it's in that sense, I think, that Kelly is more than just his forms in premonitory. Uh, let's look again at one other figure in the University of Caracas in this whole coming together of a new hard edge official art, because the mural on the right is by the last uh, foreign artist I want to deal with, Victor Vassarelli. It's a uh, mural called Positive Negative. Vassarelli is clearly the forgotten man of geometric art, or the repressed man, one might say. Uh, but his work is interestingly close, in some sense, again, to Stella. And here you see a Vassarelli uh, painting of the 1950s, 1956-59 next to a Stella called Palmito Ranch of 1961. Both stripes, and yet a crucial difference, Vassarelli wants a form built up, like Albers' original designs, remember the Monte Alban litho, wants a form built up out of an optical illusion. Vassarelli follows the profile that we've been talking about. He trained as a Bauhaus commercial artist. When he first came to Paris, he didn't go to the Louvre for years. He was astonished to find out that his favorite artist, who was the poster maker Cassandra, was in fact just mimicking forms that had been made years before by Corbusier and others. He is a pure product of design, a pure product of corporate advertising, and yet in the 1950s he takes these same techniques of tricking the eye, the same techniques of dilute constructivism, and brings them back up into a new scientific ambition for a globally meaningful art. He is the head of a group called the, uh, the uh, Center for Research in the Visual Arts, a team group in which they'll all be anonymous, not bohemian romantic artists, and in which they'll promote a kind of democracy of vision which will depend on the purely optical, which involves on dealing with the retinal vibrations of the eye in a way that is utterly democratic because it requires no elite training because it speaks directly to every man and therefore is involved with an ideal of social solidarity as well as a veneration of, uh, of science. Uh, so when we look at the optical art of Vassarelli and Stella on the right, and this is a Stella of 1961 versus a Vassarelli of the late 50s, one is dealing with a real argument, and Stella recognized this. In one of the famous interviews that Judd and Stella gave in the early 60s, the great bugbear that they beat up on was precisely Vassarelli. This was the thing that they felt was a little too close for comfort, and they were at pains to insist that their work, whatever formal similarities it had, was extremely different to Vassarelli's because in Stella's famous phrase, what you see here is what you see. That is, there is nothing that goes beyond. There is no social agenda in our art. No social implications, no theory, no rationalism in the European sense. What we're looking at when we look at these things together, when we look at Stella in the early 60s, might be compared to the translation or extrapolation of surrealism in something like Pollock's Lavender Mist, where certain principles of an earlier modern style are reimagined or transformed into a new scale, into a new physicality that leaves behind the baggage of ideology and the high claims for metaphysics of the earlier style. What one is looking at in Stella may be a similar play as Pollock to surrealism in relationship to early constructivism that the style, that the form, and the formal language is given a new lease on life by dropping the baggage that it formerly carried with it, that the style and the forms of abstraction are literally now put into play. So that when you come back to this collision, and we go back to Albers or Morile versus Stella, and when we think about the revival of the constructivist tradition in two different sides, the leap back, by Judd and Malievich, 
over the ascending curve of the diluted constructivism that rises out of design in Vasarelli, in Soto, and so many other artists, one has a ripe confusion that goes back to the principle we set out at the outset, which is that very different intentions and extremely different ambitions can gravitate towards the same set of forms. So that when you're looking at a comparison like this, you have a collision within an extremely similar set of formal languages of idealism on the left versus empiricism on the right, a classic split between European and American ambitions, between a rationalism involving the activity of the mind, a kind of hope for a universal language of forms, versus a more pragmatic approach on the right, what you see is what you see a European idea of foundational thinking, which believes that art is reducing to a set of essences to find a universal language, and a more a democratic, different kind of democratic anti-foundationalism in the individualism of Stella, Judd, etc. So that an art of hard-edged geometry in a long tradition out of Russian constructivism emerging in Vasarelli and Soto and the others as the art of a social collective with fixed meaning whereas Stella, Judd, Andre, et cetera, arguing for their art as an art of individualism that adjourns the idea of meaning in favor of an emphasis on praxis. We are back in some sense where we started with the problem about the eye and the mind, the mind being stressed on the right, the, upon the, on the left, and in Stella, the idea of a more pure, immediate opticality where the mind and deeper rationalization is not involved. In both cases, one is rebuffing subjectivity and claiming objectivity in two very, very different utopias, each flawed in their different way, and why minimalism might be flawed and why this vision of pragmatic, what you see is what you see as a stopping point, uh, might be flawed, will be something we'll take up next time. I only stress here that we are dealing now with a more confused picture of simple things than the one we started with, and that we have a vision of history emerging from the collisions and confusions that I've tried to sow that does not have to do with catastrophe theory any more than with conspiracy theory. That it is not about fixed intentions. That it does not deal with clean demises and new inventions. That in fact it is one in which recyclings of form are constant, in which arguments are constant, in which reinventions from old to new are the motor that makes things go, and in which there is a rich interchange from architecture into art and from mere design to high art in, a, in, in intention. So that even at its most reductive, even in the urge to pare down to pure geometry, which seems to govern so much of the art of the real, abstraction in the examples we've set here and in general, in fact, provides no respite from interpretation nor any retreat from the contingencies of history. Thank you.